good evening and welcome to the August 10, 2009 regular monthly meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. I would ask uh, Clerk Deb Lane to please read the roll call. Chairman Rowe. Here. Councillor Backer. Here. Councillor Jordan. Here. Councillor Lennon. Councillor McKinney. Here. Councillor Sherman. Here. And Councillor Swift Kayata. Here. Would those present please rise and join me in a pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Town Council reports and correspondence. Paul? I have uh, one item. Uh, this is very interesting, and I just thought I'd share it with anyone who might be viewing our proceedings. Uh, yesterday evening, um, about 7 p.m., my daughter-in-law contacted us and told us that um, my son's uh, unit would be flying into Bangor, Maine at 11 p.m. for refueling on, on their way to Iraq. He's in the Army. And um, so my wife and I got in the car and headed up to Bangor. And we landed in the parking lot just when the plane was touching down. It was a very surreal experience. And um, we went into the airport. And uh, 500 uh, soldiers from his battalion, you know, got off the plane, and it was it was just a great experience. And we have uh, main greeters that um, volunteer on a 24-hour basis at, in, at the Bangor International Airport, and they greet every single plane that goes through that airport. And there were seven uh, yesterday evening. So it's really a neat thing, and you know, you look at those young troops and. They're doing really, you know, great service for all of us. So. That's for sure, Paul. And uh, we join you, I know, and, and the rest of the folks in town in, in hoping for success in their mission and, and their personal safety. And uh, Godspeed. Thanks. Thank you. Other reports and correspondence? I have a few items here. Uh, Chairman, put his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave, I didn't see it. I, I I didn't really prepare anything about the uh, recent Beach to Beacon uh, race in our town, but it's a real privilege to be able to participate in that uh, as just a, your average uh, runner. But to just see the way the town supports this event, especially the uh, folks who lie in the streets uh, cheering you on. Uh, and I just wanted to make particular mention of uh, Vicki Poole, who was honored as the uh, uh, I, I mean, I hate to say oldest, but anyway, the oldest uh, participant to finish. And at a celebration event after the race Saturday night, uh, she was given a permanent number, uh, 1920, I think it was the year of her birth, 1927. Uh, so for all the future races that she participates in, she's, she's in. So she won't have to be like the rest of us sitting by the computer trying to get a number. <laughs> But it was a real, three, a real thrill to see her be recognized, and it was just a thrill to see this event go so well again. And I really thank all the folks locally who are putting this great event on. Thanks, Steve. Other reports and correspondence? I do have a few items here. Uh, first, our condolences go out to the John Casey family. Uh, John's a longtime administrator and educator in our in our school system, and his wife Deborah has also taught for many years at our middle school. Uh, as most of us know, uh, they lost their son Sean in a swimming accident at Sebago Lake this past week. So our heartfelt sympathy goes out to family and friends of the Caseys. Um, I would remind counselors of the letter we received from County Commissioner Dick Feeney uh, a few days ago uh, announcing the caucus for District 2 local officials in the county. This caucus will be held uh, the day after tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, August 12th at 4.30 p.m. in the Peter J. Feeney Conference Room at the Cumberland County Courthouse. And the purpose of the caucus is to nominate and elect members of the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee for this year. Uh, I have served on the Budget Advisory Committee uh, this past year and found it to be a very enlightening and, and rewarding experience. And I would encourage any of you who have any interest at all, even if you're going off the council this year, uh, most of the work of the committee will be done before the the uh, regime change, if you will. So I would encourage you to uh, attend the caucus on Wednesday. Again, that's 4.30 uh, at the Cumberland County Courthouse. Um, 
On September 12th, an initiative that is co-sponsored by the, the U.S. Coast Guard and also the state will open 52 of Maine's lighthouses to the public. Um, this will occur again on September 12th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, this will be an opportunity for tremendous views and it will also be a great chance to uh, connect with Maine's uh, maritime heritage. So I'd encourage citizens to, uh, to turn out at, at one or more of the, of the lighthouses on September 12th. Um, a reminder that uh, nomination papers are now available for the upcoming local elections. Um, local elections and also uh, for the Portland Water District uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, signed petitions are due back to the clerk, Deborah Lane, on Friday, September 4th. So you, if you have political aspirations, uh, be sure to drop by, pick up a nominating petition. The requirements are that you be a Cape Elizabeth citizen. Uh, and that you gain uh, signatures of 25 uh, citizens to be officially put on the ballot. And finally, um, the First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, uh, which is actually located in South Portland but serves many Cape Elizabeth residents, is uh, celebrating its 275th anniversary this year. And uh, so we have a, a proclamation that the town councilors have signed tonight, and I will read it for you. Uh, whereas the First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ of South Portland, Maine, was established on May 7, 1733, and is concluding its celebration of its 275th anniversary, and whereas the beginning of the landmark church on Meeting House Hill was first constructed in 1834-1835 in what was then known as the town of Cape Elizabeth, and whereas the First Congregational Church of South Portland long served as the primary house of worship serving Cape Elizabeth residents and was a center of social life in the community from its initial founding, and whereas the First Congregational Church of South Portland continues to serve residents of Cape Elizabeth and the region through community outreach in affirming human rights and in providing fellowship and service, now therefore be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby congratulate the First Congregational Church on their 275th anniversary, and we thank them for all that they have done to serve our community over the past 275 years. Signed, uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Congratulations to the church. Um, other reports and correspondence from councilors? Seeing none, um, we offer our first opportunity for citizens to speak to items that are not on tonight's agenda. Mr. Prince. Week two. Installment two. Thank you. Fred Prince to Rocky Hill Road. This is part two on health care. Uh, in looking at the Cape school plan, we're talking about the entire health care plan. The Cape, the Cape school plan is either fully insured through Blue Cross Blue Shield or is self-funded through the union. If it's fully insured through Blue Cross Blue Shield, the advantage is you know exactly what the cost is, but the disadvantage is you have less plan design freedom and it's more expensive. If it's self-funded, there are two components to self-funding. And this is going to be a little bit confusing tonight, but I've got to get through this. The first component is a specific stop loss, and that means that uh, all the small claims, and you wouldn't call a small claim $50,000, but for a large employer, that's a small claim. Those are paid by the employer. The insurance company is not involved. That amount can go for anywhere from $10,000 to $50,000 to $100,000, depending upon the size of the company. The other is the aggregate stop loss, and that's all the small claims under that $50,000 level, if we use that as a specific, then accumulate to what the company, the insurance company says, will uh, meet the attachment point. Now the attachment point is what the company expects to have as claims, and they add a 25% extra on top of that to make sure they don't have to spend any money. The insurance company is trying to design the contract so they receive premiums and don't pay out money. That's the idea, okay? Cost breakdown. Fixed costs basically are one-third of the total cost of the plan. Claims are two-thirds. That's not cut in stone, but that's 
uh, generally right. So that means if you have a $3 million plan, $1 million is going towards fixed costs, which is the cost of the insurance, the administration, etc., and two-thirds are going towards the claims. The question I have is, uh, let, me, let me go back away. So if the claims are $2 million and that's the attachment point, if we take 25% from that, we see that the claims the insurance company expects to, to, to have that year is a million six. So there's a $400,000 difference between a million six and two, and two million dollars. So the questions I've raised are, if the Cape plan is through the union and is fully insured, first question is why? The town has less chance for, uh, to save any money and the, plans, uh, and the plan design is absolutely not robust. Two, if the Cape plan is self-funded through the union, and the claims are below two million dollars. Does the plan pay 88 percent of the two million dollars, or does the plan pay the actual? Does the town pay the actual claims? Now I have companies and have had companies where the claims are below the expected. So, for example, if the claims came in at a million five or a million two or a million dollars. Are we paying 88% of $2 million? And the thought that went across my mind was, let's say you just had two towns. Both had, we'll say 200 employees, both had a $3 million, uh, $3, a $2 million aggregate. One town had no claims, and one town had $4 million in claims. Well, the town that had no claims is going to have to pay for the town that had $4 million in claims because they're part of that pool. So where's the incentive for the towns to drive down the claims? There is none. I'm just about done. Uh, if we pay 80% of the maximum claims, okay, if, we, uh, if we're all part of the large union and the group is healthy, where is the incentive to, dri to drive down the claims? Unions don't design low-cost plans. Okay? In the area of health insurance, a smaller plan actually is a better plan than a larger plan, contrary to everything which everybody has told you. And I'll back that up as time goes on. Next week, I'm going to talk, or next month, I'm going to talk about personal arson. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Other citizens would like to speak to items not on this evening's agenda? Seeing none, uh, town manager's report? Yeah, I trying to move things along. I won't have a long report except to follow up on what uh, Dave Sherman said. Uh, you mentioned Vicki Poole. Uh, she's, what, 81 years old. Uh, the, the median age of all the Cape Elizabeth finishers was 41. Uh, half were under the age of 41, half were uh, over the age of 41. Also, of the approximately, uh, I think it was almost 800 Cape Elizabeth finishers, 50.1% uh, were women and 49.9% were men. So it, it, it didn't follow the, the general pattern of the race, but, but I think that those, those numbers show uh, that, this is, that this is an event which appeals to many, many different segments of the community. Uh, and uh, you know, it continues to be challenging, I think, for everyone, but is, uh, you know, is, is something that has tremendous impact, uh, particularly you know, following up on what Fred Prince has just said, and I'm not sure what personal Austin is, we'll find out next month. But uh, you know, it shows that a lot of people in Cape Elizabeth are, are interested in, in watching after their health, and uh, you know, I don't think there's any better indicator of that than all the people you see jogging, and biking, and walking out on the streets uh, every single day from before sunrise to uh, after sunset. So, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mike. We'll now uh, review the minutes of the meeting held on July 13, 2009. Do I have a motion? Second. Moved and seconded to, to accept uh, as written. Uh, discussion on the motion? Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, six zero, thank you. Item number 119 2009, consent to games of chance application. Uh, St. Bartholomew's Church uh, is applying to the State of Maine Department of Public Safety to operate a bingo game or a game of chance on September 12, 2009. Consent of the municipal officers is required as part of the application process. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Dave? Moved. Do we have a second? Second. 
Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none. All in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Item number 120-2009, uh, the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee will present their report, and I would yield the floor to uh, Committee Chairman Nancy Marshall. I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank my fellow committee members of the Library Study Committee. They worked very hard and diligently on the charge, the challenges of the charge that came from the town council. And they worked with great acumen and when the occasion presented itself with some humor, which we needed every so often. Now, Michael. Which double click on right, right from the mouse right there. Double click. Just hit OK. I don't have a laptop. Coming up there. Yep. And then just use these arrows to yep. advance. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, the Thomas Memorial Library, a new vision for the Lighthouse of Knowledge. You may recall that um, you weren't around, I don't think, but William Ligery Thomas, when he dedicated the library in 1919, called it his little Lighthouse of Knowledge. And what the uh, Library Study Committee would like to do tonight is to give you a new vision for this Lighthouse of Knowledge. You all know, uh oh, there's my Virginia accent there. You all know what the uh, existing TML complex looks like. At the far left, the 1919 library that Thomas uh, dedicated. Uh, on the right, the old Pond Cove School, which is the adult library. And in between, the connectors that were built in 1980s. When we put out the RFP for a consultant, one of the very important phases was an assessment of the existing library. And multiple assessments were conducted. We did a functional one, how are things working in the library? An architectural one, what does the building uh, have that needs to be looked at? Engineering, the infrastructure, the HVAC, the, the electrical systems. Um, we did peer comparisons with our state peers and national peers, and we did a lot of public input, which was a very important aspect of the study. More than 100 deficiencies were identified by all of these assessments, and some of the shortcomings are quite serious. Right now, the, the uh, library is exceeding its floor loading capacity for materials. There's a potential of mold and air quality problems. It is not, in many aspects, ADA compliant, and there are accessibility issues. It has inefficient and obsolete HVAC systems. Its highly inefficient layout makes it very difficult for staff and for patrons. The existing facility severely limits the ability of the library to serve the public with high quality 21st century services. And it can only offer, despite the hard work of the staff, an average level of service to the community. The demographics of Cape Elizabeth are such that we should have very heavy library use. Where did we get the public input from? Well, almost a thousand residents participated in various forums there were 10 focus groups held. There were interviews done by the consultants with individuals. There were two surveys, one a telephone and one a website survey on the library's website. And there was a design charrette where the public was invited to come and talk with the architects and the consultants and the library committee. What would they like to see in a library? Well, I think if we put together all of what people said they would like, we would probably have to have a mini Pentagon, but we know that's not a reality. But what are the main things that went across many different discussions that the public wanted? 
They wanted it fully accessible to everybody. There's many that realize that it is not accessible to a lot of people. They want it energy efficient and environmentally friendly. They want the library to use its staff resources wisely. They want it to serve as a center of community life. And they want it to offer exceptional services to patrons of all ages. And they still want it located in the town center. So the architects put all of those assessments together and they are recommending a building of approximately 22,500 gross square feet. The current library is about 13,000 gross square feet. And this would meet the long-term and probably longer even uh, needs of the Cape Elizabeth Library and of the Historical Preservation Society, which as you know, is now housed in the library. There also was a determination that constructing a facility of this size on the existing site, including the parking that would be necessary, would be challenging, but it would definitely be a possibility. The study committee looked at four different options. Do nothing. Reprogramming the existing space. Put an addition on to existing structures or build a new facility, which the study committee calls the clean slate option. Doing nothing is really not an option. The deficiencies, as I mentioned, are serious and they are wasteful. Reprogramming existing space is a poor option. It could be very expensive with little or no gain in functionality. Both the addition option and the new facility option were examined in detail. And no fewer than seven different scenarios were formulated and critiqued by the study committee. Let me say a word about the addition option. What the addition option would be, would be retain the Pond Cove School, but raise the rest of the structures. And the clean slate option would be to raise all of the structures, but there are a few caveats with that. One addition scenario and one clean slate scenario were explored in greater detail and cost estimates were developed for each approach. The costs for both of these approaches were comparable. The addition scenario between 5.5 million on the low side and 7.5 million on the high side. A clean slate scenario, 5.1 million to 7.8 million. And the reason why the retention of Pond Cove, the Pond Cove building would not save a great deal of money is that it would have to be moved forward on the lot, a new foundation would have to be built, and the building itself would have to be renovated in any case. So there are not great savings in retaining the Pond Cove building. The pros and cons of both of these approaches were considered at great length by the study committee, and we voted to recommend the clean slate approach. However, the consultants were instructed to retain historical elements of the old Spurwing School, which for us is the facade, and design elements of the old Pond Cove School building. What we saw as the advantages of the clean slate, the site would allow for a great deal of design creativity. It would give us some flexibility to repur repurpose space in the future. One level of building eliminates elevators and stairs, which is a problem in the current library. It would give better sight lines and supervision for staff. It would lower operating costs over time. And the cost, the big issue for us was that the costs were comparable to the addition approach. We felt that it was fiscally responsible of us to recommend this approach. So we told the consultants and architects to develop a conceptual plan and drawings based on this clean slate approach. So here is a conceptual exterior view. And what that means in essence 
Oh, can you get the, well, the car is proceeding from the intersection on Scott Dyer Road. So that is what the, uh, the building would look like. It could look like that. It doesn't mean it would look like that. And the reason there is so much glass is because one of the elements that we were very concerned about was to take advantage of natural light. So in a, in a further uh, iteration of any building, um, that doesn't mean that all of those glass would be in there. But it also gives you what the mass is as you would be coming down Scott Dyer Road uh, to see how the building would be laid out on one floor. If you were a bird and the roof wasn't on, you would see it this way. Now I'm going to see if I can get the arrow here. Nope, won't work. Uh, again, Scott Dyer Road is up at the top um, of, of the picture. There's lawn space. The green under that is the children's library, the purple uh, adult library, the blue, a new teen uh, space. The purple, the light purple, <clears throat> the historical society, the dark purple, some um, multi-purpose rooms uh, and a conference room and the great part um, circulation and for staff and the processing of materials. The entrance is off of the parking lot and one of the things that we wanted was to be able to have the meeting rooms open in the evening even if the library were closed. So that configuration allows for that to happen. So that's kind of a, what that would look like. Here's a conceptual view of the adult area. And if you look straight through, do you see a cupola back there? Do you see a cupola? Okay. <laughs> we would like to retain in some form the cupola that's on the, the Pond Cove School at the moment. And even though it looks like it's taking up a lot of room there, it could be used for a gathering place um, for new information, for new books, it could hold a bank of computers, but it would bring and tie in the old building with the new. And people remember that as a very uh, nice aspect of the Pond Cove School. And this is a view of the children's area. The one, uh, there could be the children's area, the one uh, rendering that the architects did not do was in the Cape Elizabeth Historical uh, Preservation Society area, which is where we're suggesting the facade from the old Spruing School be, which would fit in nicely with the historical aspects of the work there. Funding. The library is a municipal service, and so there needs to be public funds. But we, reality being what it is, I think we realize there needs to be both a public and private fund mix. We need to determine the requirements of each of those. The private funding target is not knowable without a fundraising capacity study. I think that a lot of people feel that Cape Elizabeth could afford this, but that doesn't mean that the people would be willing to go ahead with it. We would need several large leadership gifts in any case. And, but the new library will have several exciting naming opportunities that might appeal to people who would be interested in making large gifts. What are the next steps? The development of an initial design and elevation drawing, should we go forward? Ongoing discussions with the community and with potential donors. Identification of a leadership team. And again, conducting a fundraising capacity study absolutely essential in the funding considerations. So this is our final report. It is the culmination of 20 months of work by the Library Study Committee, but it is only the beginning of the dialogue for a 21st century library for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. Be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions at this time for Nancy or any of the committee? We have several committee members here, uh, Ed Nadeau, 
Norm Jordan, Jessica Sullivan. I have a quote. Anne Swift Dad. And Anne. And Anne, yes. Uh, on the committee, yeah. Yeah. And Jay Sharma, And Jay, yes. Director of the library. Thank you, Jay. Uh, any questions, Dave? I was just curious uh, on the feasibility study for the fundraising. Do you have any sense of what that would cost for a feasibility study? Well, we did ask the consultants, and um, they thought around 25 but others have said less. So um, I think probably in that ballpark somewhere. Paul? Oh. And Nancy? Yes. Great job, by the way. Thank you. Really great job. Um, as you were looking at the architectural possibilities, did you consider a, a Leeds building? And, and did you consider the energy issue? Because we all know energy costs are going up in the future. And yeah. I know that our energy committee has done a terrific job, and I wonder if you've talked to them and thought about a self-sustaining building. Well, um, definitely the answer to that question. We haven't talked to the energy committee, but the architect that we worked with um, <coughs> has done LEED certified buildings, and that was certainly one of the issues that we made clear that not only did we want it energy efficient, but we wanted it environmentally friendly, and that would fit in with the other actions that the town council has taken in terms of, of wanting a more green um, town and energy. So definitely in the plans. You see, these, this is a concept study. Right. It's so the next step is if we were going to go on, we would have to get involved with architect detailed architectural drawings and, and so on. And so, But, you know, it's, it's interesting because we've gone deep in some areas and, and not been able to go deep in others because we weren't given quite that charge. Ann? I, I just wanted to reiterate um, what Nancy said about the drawings because uh, several people have asked me about the drawings. Those drawings are conceptual. It doesn't mean that even if the library got built eventually that it would be what some people perceive to be sort of a modern kind of looking building with lots of glass. The, the building illustrations are meant to be um, indicative sort of of the size and shape of the building. But things about, you know, the windows and the roof line and all that kind of stuff would be open to, uh, there would be many options. And the town center um, zoning rules, I think, are in effect even, even for municipal buildings. So it would have to be something in keeping with the town center rules. So it wouldn't look out of place. And a few people have said to me they thought that looked very modern to them. But that's just an illustration to give you an idea of the mass of the building and the size of it. And an important, um, an important point, I think, is that it would all be on one floor. And that's important because when we talk about accessibility issues, it's not just ADA for people who are in wheelchairs or on crutches or whatever, but we did get a fair amount of feedback from focus groups and from in the surveys that people who are more senior citizens are dissuaded from going to the current library because to go to either the adult library or the um, children's library, you have to climb a bunch of stairs. And it's a, you know, we're, we're all lucky that we're in the situation where that's not something that impedes us. But for a, a town like Cape Elizabeth, which is older on average, has the highest median age of any town in Cumberland County, that's an important point because we want people, this is a people's building, and we want our library to be accessible to everybody um, of whatever generation they are. So I just wanted to make those two points. Thank you, Ann. Other questions or comments? Uh, I just want to remind the town council that we're dealing here as well with a level of service F intersection. Uh, that is the primary intersection next to the library. And if we want that library to be accessible, we want it, we have any thought of it being built, there's a real challenge in getting approvals with a level of service intersection and in getting pedestrian access in the town center to a facility such as this. Thank you, Mike. Um, I would point out that we do have a 
a workshop scheduled for September 3rd at 7.30, and that workshop is a public, uh, open to the public. Uh, it will be held at the Thomas Memorial Library, and we'll begin uh, with a tour of the, the present library. Um, and then we'll, we will hopefully get into this report uh, later on in that meeting. Uh, members of the committee, uh, Jay will be there um, to answer any questions. And consultants. The consultants will be there. Consultants will be there. The architect. Yep. 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 Um, so anyone who is interested at this point, I know a lot of people sometimes hang back on issues until it almost gets to crunch time and then come forward, but uh, this is a good time to, to get involved if you haven't been involved already. Um, Again, that's September 3rd at 7.30 at the Thomas Memorial Library. Other comments or questions from the counselors? Anne? I just have a question. I can't, my memory is failing me. I can't remember if we had to, if we previously voted to receive this report or if we had to vote to receive this report. And if we haven't, I'd make a motion that the council receives the report. We can do that. Let's be sure and receive it twice rather than... <laughs> Yeah, that's I'll, true. I'll second the motion okay. then. We'll really receive it. We've been seconded that we receive the report and refer it to workshop. I think we already did, but we'll okay. make sure. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? 6 0. Thanks. Thanks, thank Anne. You. Thank you. And Nancy, thank you thank and your you. committee for the great job, that not only that you did tonight, but that you've done in leading this group through this whole process. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have attended some of the forums and charrette and so forth, and have really enjoyed uh, the transparency in the process. I think you've, you've given people a multitude of opportunities to come forward and express themselves and, and chip in. And uh, to me, that's uh, what local government should be all about. And uh, you've been the leader, and you've done a great job, and your committee's done a great job as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a labor of love, at least for me. But we're not done, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, moving on, item number 121-2009, uh, Shoreland Zoning. Uh, Mike, would you like to comment on this? Yes, I, I will on behalf of the Ordinance Committee Chairman. Uh, not with us this evening. The uh, Town Council in the Town of Cape Elizabeth are, are under a July 1, 2009 deadline uh, to adopt new standards uh, for shoreland zoning uh, compatible with the state shoreland zoning regulations. Uh, obviously, it's, we're, we're after July 1. Uh, we're not the only community that, that hasn't met the deadline. Uh, but the good news is that the planning board uh, has held, held a couple of different sessions. They had one, set, one public hearing, and then they had a, a second set of public hearings. The ordinance committees also reviewed it. And what you have before you is, is a very thick document uh, that lists many different changes of which I'm not expert at uh, that, that basically come out of, out of the state's recommendations. In addition, you had on your, your place this evening, it's also posted on the town website uh, at the materials for this meeting, is, is a slight proposed change in, in the map for the Old Colony Lane area, and that came out as a result of the citizen discussion uh, at the Planning Board public hearing. So the, 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 the recommendation is to set this for a public hearing at your September meeting, uh, which is September 14, 2009. I would like to point out that that meeting is also an evening where you have a public hearing already set on the Goddard Mansion and where there is a recommendation as well to set a public hearing later on the agenda uh, for the Shore Road Path. So uh, it could be a lengthy evening. But the, the, the difficulty is if you don't do the shoreland zoning, uh, we're, we're in uh, further violation of the state mandate. Yeah. But uh, Maureen has discussed this even with the commission of the DEP, uh, and he uh, has been very happy to hear that Cape Elizabeth is progressing and indicated that uh, Cape Elizabeth is not a community that stands at the forefront of the DEP being worried about in terms of uh, uh, dealing with this issue, knowing our history of uh, protecting the, the shoreland zone. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, I, I think we're all well aware of how uh, heavy our schedule is for September 14th, but I think we'll just have to work our way through. We'll go as far as we can, and if, if we don't get things done that night, we, we may have to schedule another special meeting, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Do I have a motion? Uh, Ann, do you have a comment? I, I had a question for the manager, which I could either ask now or after there's a motion. 
Go ahead. Mike, on this uh, Shoreland zoning map that we just got, and I, yep. we just got it tonight, so I haven't looked at it in great detail, but could you explain this map or this, what this change is? I'm not sure I understand this. Yeah, the, uh, there was an, if you look at Old Colony Lane, if you look at the right side is Shore Road. Yes. If you turn it that way. And as you come in Shore Road, right now the, the zoning takes in all, the black line would extend out to the, to the it almost looks like a, a boot, a woman's boot. You see that? With a yes. heel? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right now the black line extends all the way out that full point. Under, under this, uh, the moderate high designation in the 250 foot buffer, it is reduced down to where the black line, the heavy black line is. So what is this dotted, in the black and white dotted, where it says added shoreland zoning? That, that it has been documented as RP1 wetland and is RP wetland. The, the black is added shoreland zoning and you know, it, while it changes this black line, as, as Maureen, I think, pointed out in her memo, it really doesn't provide that much relief. It's a very small amount of relief, but it really doesn't provide that much relief for those homes on the water side of Old Colony Lane. But it, it does reduce it to the extent that the state shoreland zoning allows. Okay, I'm not sure I understand that, but I, I can give Maureen a call. That would probably be wise. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, just, I just want to draw that to yeah. people's attention only because it wasn't in the pre-work for this meeting, so I just want the public to yeah. be aware. I don't know if it's a significant change or not, but I just want people to be aware of it, it that's all. In, it is not at all a significant change in its effect. Are we ready to, uh, Dave? Uh, I would be happy to make a motion. Okay, go ahead. That we uh, set a public hearing on the shoreland zoning amendments for Monday, September 14th at 7.30 p.m. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? 6-0, thank you. Item number 122-2009, uh, budget projection. The manager has prepared for us uh, in our packets, uh, some projections of the municipal budgets for fiscal year 2011, 12, and 13. Mike, can you comment on those? I'd be. Mr. Chairman, did we skip over item number 119 on our agenda? No. No. No? Is it removed? Did we do it? Yep. Yeah. Did I miss it? Yeah. Went quick. Where was I? <laughs> you were watching me fool around with the overhead, maybe. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me on my toes. Thank you. <laughs> I think you raised your hand, you Dave. Did I, did I vote for it? You voted on it. You may have moved it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're having problems on the outside. But about four against it. <laughs> it was real quick. Okay, budget projection. Uh, Here we go. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, there's been suggestions that we, we look at a three-year budget or a five-year budget. What, what, what this analysis does, it looks at last year's budget, the current year budget, in three years out, therefore five years of budgets. Uh, it, it looks at where we project expenditures being and where we expect the major revenues to be. Uh, it does show very moderate increases in, in portions of the budget. It shows outlay, which is what we spend for paving roads, replacing equipment, increasing 100,000 each year to near the needed level. Uh, we're, we're, we've kept reducing that year after year, and uh, you know, fortunately, we've, we've found little ways to plug holes through the bond money and a few other areas. But we, we need to be looking at the outlay, and you'll be getting a new capital improvement plan in the next month or so that, that looks at that. Uh, but anyway, if you you know, this projects that over this five-year period, the average tax bill for a home in Cape Elizabeth for municipal school services, non-school services, would go up a total of $15. Uh, homes would pay in 2013, a $300,000 home, $15 more than they paid in 2009. That's uh, it's an increase in the overall tax rate of three-tenths 
of 1%. Uh, if you look at the, the tax rate of 1746, over the five-year period, this is not three-tenths of 1% a year, it's uh, three-tenths of 1% in the tax rate. And, you know, and I think what this shows, you know, the numbers are going to change every year, but it shows that you know, unlike, you know, we keep hearing about the schools and falling off the cliff, you know, th th there doesn't appear to be the same situation in the municipal budget, primarily because over the last two years, the town council, as it's done, the budget has downgraded revenues. Uh, there, there are a couple of points I should note in this. First, it assumes no changes in the excise law. Uh, there's, there's a referendum on the, the ballot in November, which will very well could pass. Uh, which, and if that does, that hurts this budget to the tune of about 750 to $800,000 uh, that, that the, the resources would need to come from an area other than the excise tax uh, or, or there would have to be some uh, savings in spending or a combination of both. It also doesn't include any assumption for a major new as yet unauthorized capital expenditure uh, and as or for any capital expenditure that monies have not been identified or set aside for. So for example, to, to be blunt about it, if the library, you know, came forward uh, or any other, you know, major, major project that the, the town council hasn't uh, taken a position on yet, uh, that would be an addition to this. But overall this shows with, you know, maybe with the recommendation of municipal uh, Operations Review Committee, and you know, with continued support from uh, the department heads and everyone working together, that you know we're in good shape for the next three years, and uh, we shouldn't expect any any alarming problems, with the one exception of uh, the possible uh, change in uh, how motor vehicles are excised in the state of Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I know we've had a lot of interest in the citizens uh, about looking ahead. In our budget projections and so forth, and I think this is a great step in that direction. Uh, thank you for your work. Uh, any questions, comments, Ann? I have two questions. Um, Mike, I wanted to make sure I understood on the, uh, the excise tax referendum in November, if that passed, you said that would reduce revenues approximately $750,000. That's over what, what period? Over that? Each year. Each year? Each year. Okay. The, the main Heritage, whatever they call themselves. Policy Center. Center. Main Heritage Policy Center. They estimate about 40% uh, so on a statewide basis. If you look historically at Cape Elizabeth and the aging of cars, and you look at, you know, my sense is that there's, there's impacts there as well for some energy type things, which I think, you know, Cape people might be adopters. You know, um, my sense is we could be closer to 50% primarily because we get more of our revenue from the, the newer cars than most communities do on average in the state of Maine. And so close to 50%, you mean close to 50% of 50 our... 50% of the amount we collect for excise. If you look... Of, uh, of excise tax. Yeah, the budget last year, if you look at the final sheet, mm. uh, for excise was $1.5 million. Uh, it's projected to be that the next two years, and then climbing to $1.6 million when we begin to get out of the, the bad economy in 2013. So if you take 50% of 1650, oh, that's 825,000. Uh, if you take 50% of the FY 2010, 11, and 12 amount, that's a little over 750,000. Okay. And then um, my other question was, uh, you said one of your assumptions was this didn't include any, uh, the impact of any major capital expenditures not now voted on, like a new library, for instance. Yeah. Would that include uh, any Money, any of the money. I'm thinking of the town center intersection. Would that include the 100 or 200 thousand dollars? I can't remember how much it was for the town center intersection. The difference between the 83 percent funding level. Yeah, the and 17 percent. No, my my sense with the town center intersection is the bids have come down. You uh -huh. know, and that's the same thing M. Dodd said by about 15 percent since the peak. If that's the case, we'd be at 85 now. So it's 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 pretty close. So you don't think, it, and I know this is, you know, not yeah. cast in stone, but you don't think that if the town center intersection project were to pass, that it would necessarily have any impact on I don't. This, this budget outlook looking? No, I don't. No. Five. The, the one other thing I would point out while you're asking those types of questions, 
Fort Williams Park self support. The fort cost about 200000 The council set a goal for next year uh, to have the, the park self sufficient. This assumes that it'll give me 75% of the way there, even though your goal is 100% in 2011 and 100% of the way there in 2012 and 13. Other questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Prince? Yeah, you can come to the. Fred Prince, 2 Rocky Hill Road. I didn't see this, but two questions. What are you building in for an inflation increase in your health care? I'm assuming that employee benefits over the next four years is flat. That's because I'm assuming we'll make some structural changes and how we provide employee benefits. Okay. Number two, what are you assuming for state contributions to, to the town? I remember last year we lost $200,000 because the state didn't have any money. This is only municipal, not state. I'm assuming last year the budget was $685,000 for state revenue sharing. This year it's six fourteen. dollars I'm assuming it dropped to six hundred dollars next year, and then it'd be six fourteen dollars the following two years. Why not cut that down more? We already lost $200,000 this year, as I recall, on the school budget. This is only state revenue sharing. This does not include any school. This budget does not include any projections of school expenditures or school revenues. This is only municipal. It's municipal. Just okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to, Fred, want to, I'll give you my copy. <laughs> it is online as well, if anyone would like to uh, see it. Other comments and questions? Uh, no action is required on this item, but uh, again, I would like to thank him for his work and, and having us look forward. Yeah, I'd just like to add that I think this is really excellent work and it's very helpful for future planning and also for putting a lot of major decisions in context. So thank you. Ready to move on? Uh, item number 123-2009, uh, parking regulations. Uh, Chief Williams is come forward with a couple areas of concern uh, the police department has regarding parking uh, near Casino or Maiden Cove Beach on Cottage Lane and also on the Shore Road uh, near the South Portland Line. Uh, he, he's recommended some changes there, but uh, in so doing, uh, it has been recommended that the Ordinance Committee conduct a comprehensive review of all of our parking regulations in town uh, and report back to the Town Council in November. Do I hear a motion, Dave? Well, I, I'll, I have a question, but I could make the motion first. Okay, why don't you, get, let's get a motion on the floor. Sure, I'll, I move that we forward uh, this recommendation uh, that the Ordinance Committee conduct a comprehensive review of all local parking regulations and report back to the Town Council in November of 2009. Second. Motion second. Now discussion on the motion, Dave. I haven't really studied this issue. Does this require planning board input? Or not? These are no, not, the not zoning specifically. Okay. One of the the corollary issues here is the the, the 551, 553 Shore Road issue. There's been some suggestions that that the parking be limited along Shore Road in that section, and uh, the suggestions have come from some residents of Charles Road. This would enable that to be this motion and this review would enable that to be looked at. provides the framework for doing it. But there are other, there's more than that that's, oh yeah, there, there's plenty of impetus behind this. Oh, other than, you know, yeah. Yeah, there, there's that, you know, the, the, the chairman mentioned uh, the casino beach. Every year we get approached with someone wanting to add a little piece, add a little piece. I just assume the, the ordinance committee went down there and walked it and, and looked at it comprehensively. There's, there's other issues of you know, that we've got a lot of complaints about parking and bikeways and should we allow it, shouldn't we allow it. It just, it, you know, I think the Ordinance Committee will have a chance to gain pub, gather public input and see, you know, it's, a, it's just a good chance for, if anyone has any concerns about parking anywhere in town, this would be a good chance to bring it forward. Thanks. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Six zero. Thanks. Item number one twenty four dash two thousand nine. Uh, the Maine Municipal Association uh, annual ballot. Uh, Ann, would you like to speak to this? Sure. 
Every year, the Maine Municipal Association elects new, uh, new members of the executive committee and also new directors and also a vice president. Um, the process is that there is a nominating committee uh, with representatives from um, all over the state. And this year, I chaired the nominating committee at, since I'm the past president of the Maine Municipal Association. That's the traditional role. Um, the uh, nominating committee nominated the three directors that you see on this attached ballot. Uh, Matthew Arnett, Joyce Maker, and Peter Nielsen from respectively the towns of Hampton, Callis, and Oakland to, be, to elect these folks as directors for a three-year term. Uh, the nominating committee also nominated for vice president Mark Green, who is the town manager, town of Sanford. Uh, there is, so those are the nominees of the nominating committee, and I am very confident in our in the recommendations. Uh, also, uh, there is another process by which uh, a municipal official in the state can nominate him or herself as uh, long as he can get petitions from five towns. Um, and Stephen Bunker, who is a fine selectman from the town of Farmington, was also a candidate that we interviewed during the nominating process. A, a very good candidate, but not quite as good in our opinion as a nominating committee uh, to be vice president. And so he um, is on the ballot also. So these, the three directors races are not a competitive race in that there are, it's vote for three. Um, the vice president race uh, and the vice president traditionally becomes the, the president automatically will become the next president of MMA. Uh, I would make a motion that we support the nominating committees nominees uh, to include the three directors and also Mark Green uh, for the vice presidential job. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? 6-0. Thank you, Ann. And thank you again for your service on the Maine Municipal Association. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It's been a great opportunity. It's one of my last official duties as past president. They'll miss you. Mm. Uh, item number 125-2009, interlocal agreement with the City of Portland. Uh, this is the finalization of our agreement for dispatch uh, services uh, in conjunction with the Portland Police Fire Department, Portland Police Dispatch. Uh, Mike, would you like to comment on this? Uh, yes, I'm very pleased to present the, the final document. There's, in, in, there's just one minor change in the term paragraph. It, it uh, just there's going to be slightly different language here because it conflicts, as Councillor Backer pointed out, with with six. And we have language that we've agreed to with Portland that may, that merely says that the term shall be uh, in accordance uh, with the the provisions of paragraph six. Uh, it's not a substantive change at all. It just uh, it, as David said, it didn't make a whole lot of sense uh, the way it was uh, drafted. It's one of these things you keep redrafting. Paragraph six kept getting redrafted over and over, and it, they didn't go. We didn't go back and change five. But, but anyway, it, it seems to be working fairly well. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of good praise for the service from the city of Portland. Our firefighters have been going in to see the dispatch center and have been very impressed uh, with the technology that's there and with the dedication of the city of Portland personnel. Uh, in, uh, in providing uh, uh, dispatch services. Uh, all of the provisions of this, the cost, is, is exactly as was discussed uh, during the budget process. Uh, it, I believe it's ready for your approval. Thank you, Mike. Uh, perhaps we could uh, arrange for a tour of, by the town council. If you'd like to. to. Maybe on September uh, 14th? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, do I have a motion? Yep. On the side of Penny? Uh, you can do the motion. I have some questions. Okay. Would we like to put a motion on the floor? Be heavy? Okay, David. Uh, I, I move that we authorize the town manager to sign the uh, agreement between the town of Cape Elizabeth and the city of Portland, formalizing the agreement for dispatch and public safety answering point services. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Penny? Um, my questions have to do with, um, as I read this, I don't see anything which 
talks about evaluation of services. How do we provide feedback if there is um, um, issues and concerns? And um, how do we go about uh, incorporating changes and improvements in the processes? I, I think the, the proper response to that is, Penny, is in the public safety arena, you need to do it every day. Uh, you know, you don't wait for, you don't wait, you know, for an annual review. You need to do the improvements every day. Uh, I wasn't looking for an annual review. What I'm looking for is what is the appro approach to uh, providing input to continuous improvement of services. If the, you concern, what is, yeah. and how do we make yeah. sure that changes are incorporated because all this says is here's how much we owe, but how do we ensure that we're getting the quality of service that we want? Uh, that goes back to the termination provisions and the right for either party to uh, sever the agreement uh, with 18-month with notice. The reason 18-month notice was chosen, that was something we kept going back and forth, back and forth on, is that, is that you, you need to be ready to move into something else and you don't want either party for budgeting and other purposes uh, to say we're leaving. And, and, and not have to deal with it. But, you know, there's going to be regular meetings between our chiefs and uh, Portland personnel. They've already, uh, you know, they, they've had conversations up to this point on at least a weekly basis, if not more, uh, just to ensure that everything is working properly. And, and the plan, as you point out, the plan is a constant improvement. Uh, there's, uh, you know, more technology that we want to have eventually within the fire, within the fire vehicles. So they have all, all of the, uh, the response information with laptops and the fire trucks, as you now have in the, the police cruises. For example, in the police cruises now, uh, you, know, you, can, you can see where the other police cruiser is, you know what's responding. Uh, all, all of that will be there. For, another example is the state just changed the protocols for emergency medical dispatching. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, there's much, you know, there's some concern that they're on the phone asking more questions, uh, but that's exactly what they've been told to do by Stephen Bunker, the, the, the gentleman who was just on the ballot. Uh, that's exactly what they've been told by the state's E91 Bureau in terms of what you have to do. That, you know, if it's, uh, you need to work themselves through that emergency medical dispatch. So there is, it's, it's, it is a matter of constant improvement. And, uh, you know, I, I, think I just don't see an evaluation. You know, there's nothing yeah, that there's says no evaluation of services, which no. says if you're going to terminate something, you would want it triggered by something. And so, what are we evaluating people on? I'm just yep. going to throw out points such as, I mean, um, call response times, transfer times. How long did it take to get uh, my call? Uh, transferred from Portland to whoever is going to respond. What if there's a breakdown in communication? Those types of things. How do we make sure that all of that is going to happen? Chiefs, chiefs are on top of those issues. For example, I heard from someone recently that that Portland got a call and it took 13 minutes for them to dispatch the ambulance. Mm -hmm. Maybe you heard that one too. No. Nope. No. In that particular one, what happened was is that the police officer was dispatched immediately was someone fell from a bed, mm -hmm. uh, fell in the house. So the police officer was dispatched. It was only after the police officer got there that the police officer decided this person needs an ambulance. Once the police officer radioed in mm -hmm. saying that an ambulance was needed, the, the dispatch happened within a minute and you know, the service could not have been any better and, and the, the person responded. You know, there are folks who are saying, you know, it took 13 minutes. You know, it didn't take 13 minutes. It was, it was simply that the call was first logged in, and that's part of the discussion continuous improvement. We want to be sure that the logs and, and that the, the timing, which, which is a derivative of the logs, uh, because it's, it's all automated these days, shows truly what the response is and not, not the response to when the first call came even though it might be a different service that's being requested as the call progresses. I still believe there should be some evaluation points. 
written into yeah, it's, an agreement. As this is now drafted, it says either party may terminate this agreement in its discretion. It, it gives to each party total flexibility. And I, my read of it is if you know, you, you don't want to get into issues of cause because then it becomes debatable and becomes, uh, you know, a lot more challenging. I can assure you the city of Portland has been 100% cooperative in all of the issues in dealing with this dispatch. And, you know, t this, today I heard one of the fire uh, company uh, captains speak very eloquently on how much better the service is, not as a criticism to what we were doing, but how much better the service is in terms of the, the, the speed of the calls has actually all sped up as a result of the technology. I've heard from the police officers the fact that, uh, you know, they will eat because of the, the, it'll, a call will show up on its screen the second it's transferred to the dispatcher. It shows up on the screen in the, the cruisers. And it's just a, a much more advanced level of service than we could ever provide individually. It's a little like, you know, I was reading today about Goodall Hospital in Sanford. And, you know, they're merging with Maine Health. And the reason they're merging with Maine Health is they just can't invest in the technology. They can't keep up with the reporting. They can't keep up with, with all the different changes. And that's, uh, to me, one of the real advantages of working with Portland. And Portland, you know, has just been tremendous. And, you know, this gives us, if you look at the, uh, you know, it gives us some fairly long-term guarantees in terms of cost controls. Uh, and, uh, you know, Portland knows it's not in their best interest to not provide nothing but exceptional service to Cape Elizabeth. Uh, you know, they're interested over time in serving a couple of other communities, uh, but, but not becoming too big. And, uh, you know, we, they consider us, you know, they, they were very careful. They, they were saying the ones that come in later will be sort of contract communities. Mm -hmm. You're an owner community. And, you know, that's, that's their attitude toward this, is, is that we're part of it as opposed to just another community that's, that's contracting with them. It's been, uh, you know, it's, I think it's really been a, a great experience for all of our public safety people to, to uh, work with the city and to uh, see through these different issues and, and to continue to work with them uh, as, as issues evolve. Uh, in the months and years ahead. Ann? I have a question for the manager. So Mike, basically what you're saying is that uh, this agreement would formalize the agreement and the decisions that have already been made in terms of how we do dispatch and PSAP services in our community. Um, and this is merely writing down what is already happening as of today or as of yesterday. Is that correct? As of July 1, yes. As of July 1. Thank you. Other questions, discussion, comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. Two, three, four, five. Opposed? One. Thank you. Item number 126-2009, uh, Show Road Path Committee Report. Uh, it's recommended a public hearing be set for Monday, September 14th, 2009 at 7.30 p.m. at the Town Hall on the report of the Show Road Path Committee. I hear a motion. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? All in favor of making it a really busy evening? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we offer our second opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not on the agenda. Seeing none, um, before we adjourn, I would like to announce the upcoming meetings and events. Uh, August 20th, 2009, we have our annual employee recognition lunch, and although it will take a little different form this year, we'll be having a cookout style uh, affair at Fort Williams Park. Uh, on August 26, 2009, we have a special town council meeting, uh, primarily regarding the town center intersection. There will also be a couple uh, additional items which will be on that agenda, uh, which will be published, uh, uh, smaller issues, but this will be the main one. 
Uh, September 3rd, as mentioned before, we'll have our town council workshop uh, to get into a, a little more depth on the library report. And again, this uh, workshop will be held at the library and not here at town hall, as is the custom. And on September 14th, 2009, as has been mentioned several times this evening, we have our next regular meeting, which will include uh, at least three public hearings and uh, hopefully some good discussion. Uh, I don't think there is anything else we need to discuss. I would accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much.